All right, what is up, everybody? I am trying a new style of interview for my website, uh, The Man Effect. And, um, bringing on my first interviewee, interview person. <laughs> There he is. Hey, what's up, Tim? What is up? So, everyone, this is my really good friend, Jake. And um, years ago, I took his portrait for my website. And I was recently going through... What's up, Courtney? Thanks for tuning in. Um, I was recently going through my website and updating stuff. Uh, and I came across his photo, and I thought it'd be really fun to uh, interview him in a new way. So, um, what's going to be going on here is going to be asking Jay some questions about masculinity. And if this is something you guys like, I'm going to be doing it more and posting it to a Facebook group, most likely. So, just kind of doing a trial run. We're going to have some fun. And uh, if you have questions, post them, and if I can see them, I'll uh, I'll interact with you guys. Hey, so. I want to. Can I just say something real quick too? Yeah. Uh, I've got a tons of people that it looks like it looks like they're jumping on right now onto the, on the live. Some of you guys don't know who Timothy is. Tim's a great friend of mine. We've been friends for a number of years. Yeah. Uh, met here in Kansas City a few years ago. And uh, Tim has a, like, I, my favorite thing about Tim is this, is he has a real heart to see men become who they were created to be mm -hmm. and what, what that look, whatever that looks like. And so it's been an ongoing subject and something that we've talked about for years. And so he asked me if I would jump in and, and share some of my thoughts because I actually have some interesting uh, thoughts and perspective from my own, like, life and journey. But I just want to... <laughs> For this, uh, for this platform and for this opportunity to, to talk a Dude, little bit, I'm so excited that you're open to this. I was like, who's going to be my test bat rabbit? <laughs> it's fun. I mean, it's a subject I care about too. Obviously, for my own reasons, but also because of I know many who are on the same journey of trying to figure out what is this thing called masculinity, and you yeah. know, the son. Um, it's something that I think about all the time. So yeah, and it's something we've both talked about together quite often about. So. I thought it'd be fun just to share your revelatory awesomeness on the topic of masculinity. <laughs> so we just want to say hey to everyone tuning in. If you want to drop a and say hi, please do. And if you're re-watching this, let us know. We're always, always loving to engage. So anyway, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask Jay a bunch of questions about masculinity and all of this and we're just going to kind of hang out and talk about it for a bit and then once jay gets sick of it we'll uh we'll end it so <laughs> so if if you're not familiar with my website or this is the first time you've heard of the man effect what i do is i uh i ask everyone the same question and uh it's this if you were to describe what it means to be a man in one word what would it be and why and Jay, I remember what you said a couple of years ago when I asked you this, but you don't. So I'm kind of curious to see if you use, choose the same word. Uh, I probably won't change, choose the same word just because life is a, as, as a song, as I heard a, <laughs> a, a poet say, life is a highway. But um, are you asking me to answer that question now? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, well, I, I think that the answer to that question in light of societal expectations i would actually say the one word is complicated 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 masculinity is complicated i don't think it's quite as simple as uh, there and, and the reason is because there are a tremendous amount of social pressures related to masculinity but then there are a lot of social pressures that are even related specifically to, to western culture uh, uh -huh. versus, versus other cultures and so um I think uh, it, it's complicated from a from a socioeconomic perspective, but actual masculinity I don't think is that complicated. I, I think it's as simple uh, as um, 
it's as simple as embracing, understanding and embracing who we are mm. and who we were created to be as, as men. And there is no, there is no um, formula, you know, so what, what defines masculinity for, for, um, or what stimulates masculinity, I should say, I'd rather say it that way, in one may not necessarily stimulate masculinity in others. And mm. so there's, there's a lot of discussion around that. Just that alone is enough to talk yeah. about. Wait, so you mean what it means to be a man isn't just this cookie cutter thing that you can just learn in like one reading one book? Like it's an actual process? 15 years ago, I'll tell this little story. 15 years ago, my mom passed away. And, uh, you know, all, all parents are broken. And, but my mom passed away and she left me. The last thing she gave me before she left was a book. I won't name the book. <laughs> Uh, but I'm sure some will figure it out. But uh, she left me a book, and it had to do with masculinity um, because mm. of the I was on at mm. the time. And I read that book, and that book defined for me. The book both defined for me what society's expectations were for me as a man, mm. but also it also was it also was her silent way of telling me what her expectations of me were as a man. Mm. To be real frank, um, to be real frank, I, I, that book really offended me because it yeah. said, if this is not you, if you aren't doing this, this, and this, this, that you were created for this, this, and this, if those aren't the things that are your pursuit, then you're not a man or you're a lesbian. Mm. And so I, I put that book on the shelf of, or actually I put it in the dumpster. <laughs> Uh, sorry, mom. Uh, love you. She love, love you, <laughs> but uh, love you. But but sorry, I'm 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 not that. I'm never going to be that. And uh, and I've had to go on the journey myself of of asking the hard questions of what exactly what exactly is masculinity. Mm. Not even by my own definitions, but because I because I am a believer, because I'm a Christian, um, I'm kind of going, Lord, what is your what is your definition of masculinity? How mm. do I now, who are you, and how do I relate to man? If I'm made in your image, what does that even mean? What does that say about you? What does it say about me? Yeah. So, so yeah. What, what, yeah. One second. I'm going to do some shout-outs here. Jordan's saying, what's up, Jay? Eric. We got, is it Lion? I'm probably slaughtering that name. Rob. Oh, Rob. Rob is in Australia. That's awesome. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. Jay, what I think, what, I, what I've observed in my conversations with people and stuff is that as men pursue the authentic, authentic desire of being who they are, they don't want other people to be stuck in behind in the journey, right? So it's like you want to give the helping hand out. So it's, in my perspective, like you're tender towards other men going on this journey. And you want to help them by saying like, hey, like, you don't, you're not defined by this book, right? Um, and like, I know I have a passion to help people because I, I went through like so many weekends, read so many books. And it's like, I want to see men grow in emotional intelligence and in, in insecurity in who they are. And so do you, do you think that's something that like in your journey, you're realizing you have a heart for other men to not have to go through that? Oh man, absolutely. Like it's, it's a, it's one of, it's one of, the greatest pains that I have in my own life and journey, uh, as well as seeing it in the lives of other, other men is, mm. is seeing that, that very pain. And it seems to increase more and more, uh, in every generation, you know, um, for me personally, in my own story and journey, like I didn't, I didn't have that. Mm. Um, I didn't, I didn't personally have anybody teaching me what masculinity was, and, you know, uh, yeah. it was probably the primary role, of my father to, to do that in me, but my father in his own brokenness didn't know how to, how to yeah. teach me. He didn't, you know, he didn't, and it's, and I don't mean, I don't mean the trite stuff. I don't mean like, you know, daddy didn't teach me how to shave and daddy didn't teach me how to chop wood. That's not what I mean. I just mean, I, I he didn't show me how to be comfortable in my own skin, but because he was uncomfortable in his. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and so it's a big, it's a huge pain and, and, uh, and 
something in my heart that I want to see, uh, you know, for my own son, as well as for other men um, in, in friendship, uh, something I, I long to see men come into an comfortability. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Just wanted to give a shout out to R Ryan. R Ryan, I'm sorry if I slaughtered your name. Just want to say what's up. So Jay, I'm going to jump into the next question. I'm really curious to hear what you have to say about this. When was a moment in your life where you felt most masculine? Well, I, if I could, if I could answer that, you're asking the question in a in a past tense. But if I could answer it in a in a, oh, come on, I would. I don't, I don't think there was a moment. It's kind of like, you know, a lot of people say at what time, you know, <laughs> people ask me often questions like, when did you get saved? I go, there's not a moment I got saved. I'm getting saved. I'm like, I'm being saved. It's a process. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's the same thing for me with masculinity. I'm like, I'm, there wasn't, there isn't, or wasn't a moment that I felt most masculine. There are moments when my masculinity is probed, when my masculinity is encouraged, mm -hmm. it's poked at, mm -hmm. um, that, that stirs it in me. Mm -hmm. um, and one of those moments for me, one of the primary moments um, that I feel most masculine, honestly, is when I, um, two things, it's when I am with other men. Mm. Mm -hmm. And something about being around other men, and I don't mean in a hyper, like, rrr, rrr, beat your chest kind of way, but just being with other men and realizing that the insecurities that, that I have, we all have. Like, yeah. every, every yep. man has insecurities, sharing those insecurities in a, in a place of vulnerability, openness, uh, and encouragement and affirmation of one another, um, actually, it it causes me i can't explain it it's weird i tried to explain it to my wife some years ago it's weird but there's something about being around other men that i feel like it fuels me it literally is the fuel like it makes me feel like you know what i can i can do this mm -hmm. i can i can be a man i can be a better husband i can be a better father yeah uh, simply being around other men so that's one of that's one of them mm -hmm. uh, the, the ways and the the other one which I've already mentioned the other one is uh, by putting aside by not by not giving to the pressure of uh, of I call it slavery to live up to societal expectations mm. so uh, yeah like so like you know I travel a lot so I'm traveling and you know, there's a game on or something, and people are saying, you know, I, I was traveling on Super Bowl Sunday. Um, <laughs> I didn't know it was Super Bowl Sunday because I don't care about the Super Bowl. Yeah. And so I'm in the airport, and I hear all these all these people are standing around, you know, the TV monitors going nuts over the Super Bowl, and somebody goes, yeah, who's your team? Where are you going for? And I'm like, yeah, I don't care. <laughs> and being confident in my own skin enough, knowing who I am, yeah. that my Masculinity does not have to be around a sport or a sporting no. event. No, and so so that's that's been real freeing. Now, I I don't care about sports, but I show interest in sports because, like for example, again, my son plays sports. My son plays basketball. I don't care about basketball, but I care about mm. my son. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So it's not I, that it ma makes it a lesser of thing. It's just. You don't, your identity is not wrapped around it, right? And so, right. like, I love seeing people's face when they're like, So, like, did you watch the World Series or the Super Bowl? I'm like, Yeah, I just didn't grow up with that, so I have no idea. And being someone who has a beard, there's all these assumptions that people make about me. I just love the beard, not, the beard, dude, the beard, really. Like, they, it's so fun to just break um, people's expectations of me. And being yeah. okay with that. And, and, I, and I think that's what masculinity is, is being that security in yourself and just embodying that in every day. Bro, you know? I, I'm a big guy. For those who don't know, who have never seen me in person, I'm a, I'm a big guy. I mean, look, yeah. I'm a big guy. <laughs> it was all muscle. I'm getting there. But do you know how many people say to me, I mean, total random strangers look at me and go, hey, dude, you play football? And mm. I go, I play piano. <laughs> And they're like, oh, <laughs> like 
I love shattering that mentality that because I'm a big bro black guy, I'm supposed to play football. It's just what you're supposed to do. Yeah. Or, you know, people go, you look like you look like one of the KC Chiefs. You like Chiefs? I'm like, I don't, I don't even, I could care less about the Chiefs. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's awesome. I love it. I love what Marco actually. Somebody just Marco uh, Rosa just said being a manager reaction to how you deal with daily struggles. And I think that's, there's some real truth in that. That's, that's absolutely true. That's just being present. I think the ability to not be held back by the past or be stuck in your mind by the future and just deal with what's going on in front of you is a huge skill that a lot of people have lost. Um, and so that's, yeah, dealing with daily struggles, being present. Yeah. No, I like that. Um, Sorry. No, no worries. I love it. If you see any others you want to comment on, let me know. So I'm really curious. Do you remember a point when you felt shift from being a teenager or an adolescent to being a man? Do you remember when there was this point when you're like, yeah, like, I'm a man? Um, yeah, it certainly wasn't like that moment that most people think, you know, you're, you turn 18 or you turn 21. It wasn't those moments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think for me, uh, I, I don't, I don't know that I can necessarily put an, a moment on it or an age on it, but I can say somewhere in my thirties <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. is when I started to realize, you know, I'm not a kid anymore and I, uh, I'm not a boy and yeah. there are real, there are real, um, there are real pressures that come with adulthood, but there are mm -hmm. also real pressures that come with being male and adult at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and they're real and they're not wrong. Like, you know, you don't have to chop down trees or go fishing or hunting or camping or any of those things, but a man does need to work and a man does need to take care of himself and a man does need to yeah. be responsible and does need to, you know, take, you know what I'm saying? Take care of responsibilities. And I remember Although I've been doing many of those things out of necessity, like if I didn't work, I couldn't pay my light bill. But, but there was probably some time during my thirties when mm -hmm. I, I realized, wait a minute, nobody else is going to do these things for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I am responsible for me. And mm -hmm. then I got, I, you know, I had children, and nobody's going to be responsible for my wife and my children. Other yeah. Than these are. Wow. It, uh, as a man and not because my wife can't work and not because she's not able, yeah. you know, able, but it is my responsibility nonetheless. Yeah. I, rem I don't, I don't know exactly how old I was, but I just remember I was somewhere in my thirties when I had kind of that reality kind of struck me. Yeah. That's good. I, I, I don't know one person who was like, yeah, so the day I got laid or yeah, the day I got married. There's never really this uh, black and white moment. It seems like it's definitely a journey for people. Um, I do want to shout out to everyone watching. If you have a question you want us to talk talk about masculinity, just uh, comment below and we'll, we might get to it here. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you another one though here. So I'm really curious um, to know who would you describe as someone being like um one of the most masculine people you know like just let's let's maybe yeah just someone that you look up to you don't have to give them per name but like oh. uh, yeah um there are there are there have been many in my own journey uh personally that i could call out and and thank but for <laughs> bear grills <laughs> i love it rob what are you talking about uh rob rob is my no um no seriously I, honestly uh I, I i you know i realize that many people who are watching probably are not christians or not believers and that's cool uh mm -hmm. well it's not cool i hope you become a believer jesus loves you okay but beyond <laughs> that, um but beyond that no, the reason i'm saying that is i'm prefacing my that statement with this answer like honestly i'm trying to of a person in the present there are people in the present but there's a there's one in particular who comes to mind that like is a hero of mine and he's a biblical character and his name is david and you know a lot of people mm. know who, a lot of people don't but the reason i, I look at david 
not because David uh, David was a king and he was you know he killed his thousands and his tens of thousands and he cut off the head of uh, Goliath. It, it was it's actually not that at all. The mm. reason the reason I say David is because David understood. David was in touch with his own weakness. David David knew his brokenness. David knew mm. weakness. Uh, and he wasn't afraid of it, and it didn't hinder David from still being like David as a kid made some, and even as a young man made some really stupid decisions. I mean, he he stuck a married woman and had her husband killed. He, <laughs> you know, what I'm saying he he was in trouble, but his mistakes didn't stop him from becoming who he was created to be, which was a king. Yeah, yeah. And I look at David, and and uh, David. And David gives me personally as a man, he gives me a lot of hope because I'm like, man, if mm. David so messed up and still be a man after God's own heart and still still fulfill his destiny and purpose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I don't know that when I, when I think of that question, he's literally the person that comes to mind. But in a more modern sense, uh, in a more current to the now sense, um, I don't know. That's a hard question. That's a hard yeah, question. There, it is. There are, so pe some people are watching this going, why is he not saying me? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, you. You are the reason. No, there are there are many. I just, um, it's mm. hard to nail just like one or two people. Mm. Mm. Uh, Elijah just asked a pretty cool question. He said, so how do you practically learn? I guess we'll just move on because I know it's a hard question that I asked you. So I'll give you grace on this one. But Elijah asked, how do you practically learn from your parents' mistakes in order to avoid the same things in marriage and fatherhood? That's a good question. Oh, you're asking me? Cause yeah, I, let's, when I, let's, let's, when I'm not married, so I can't. When I figure I that out, I'm there. <laughs> no, you know what? I spent, this is no joke. I spent the entire first year of my son's life when he was born. I spent the entire first year, every single, my, all of my interactions with him were from the premise of how would my father respond mm. and for the sake of, not for the sake of sentiment, not for the sake of, because I want to be like my dad. It was actually the opposite. I yeah. did not be like my dad. And really? so I think through, uh, oh, massively. I, I did not want to be like him in the, in the regard of how he related to me. I did not want to yeah. relate to my the way that my father related to me and so I would go what would my dad say and what would my dad do so that I can make sure that I say or do the opposite yeah and then I realized after literally thinking that way for a year with my son I just had like I woke up one day and I had this understanding and revelation I'm, I'm, I'm not only wasting life by doing that I'm missing moments mm. I'm actually missing moments of building history and building memories with and for my son by being enslaved to the masculinity that I did not experience. Mm. Dang. <laughs> and so um, I said, you know what? I don't want to live this way. And I hope I'm answering your question, Elijah, but I, I said, I don't want to live this way. I don't want to be enslaved to what I didn't have. I want to be free to be who I am and discover Mm -hmm. I want to be free to be who I am and let my son experience me, not let my son experience the trauma of who I wish I would have been. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of heavy. <laughs> yeah. And it, it's, it's allowing yourself to not be a victim to your past, but allowing your past to like empower you to become a better person and positively influence your kids rather than negatively influence. Exactly. And that's, that's awesome. That's, that's powerful. Um, I'm really curious if you guys are liking this, who are watching it, I'd love to hear your thoughts as we're going along. Um, this is the first time I've ever done this and Jay's been a great guinea pig. So far. I'm really liking this. My pleasure. Um, too. But why don't we, uh, jump into another question while everyone's still hanging out here. I'm curious, what's a resource in your life that's helped like encourage and uplift you um, to become the man you want to be? You know what? I'm still, I'm still figuring the greatest resource in my own personal life and journey is Jesus. Like he is my resource and my yeah. example. But uh, 
and again, I'm not trying to be preachy. I'm just being honest. This is my journey. It's my story. I've got the yep. microphone. Yeah, and, uh, you've got the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, it's him. But, uh, um, but on a you know uh, on a different way, I don't I don't like I don't. There's not a book I can tell you to go read. There's not a the greatest resource that I have honestly are are, are um, close friends to with whom to be able to process. Mm -hmm. uh, now, not only that, you know, I, I'm thankful for close friends. Um, and they're, you know, real friends are few and far between, rare in life, rare in earth, and hard to find. So I'm thankful. Mm -hmm. for that. But, um, but also sometimes, you know, sometimes it goes beyond that. And I'm thankful for, um, you know, I've seen, a, I've seen a few really good counselors in my life that have been really helpful at times mm -hmm. in, mm -hmm. uh, for me. And so yeah. grateful for that. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm, I loosely seeing one now. I started seeing in September, and uh, it's been phenomenal. Just yeah. having talking literally about this very reality with um, with him, and so yeah, that's awesome. I find that like in the journey, like of desiring to become better, that hunger draws you to resources like counseling or going to a group or you know whatever, and so. I've observed you and know that you've done a good amount of work on yourself as an individual. And I've really respected that. And, uh, I just, I don't think there is an answer to, you know, read this one book or go to this one place. Like it's a, it's a journey in my observation, you know, it's like build, building a brick wall. It's one brick at a time here, there. And so that's something I've observed of you and I've really appreciated. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there. I'll say this too, just one last thing. I know uh, there's another good question that's come in, but I was talking to a friend of mine early this morning, actually, really early. I was talking to a friend of mine and, and listen, I was, I was saying this in a humorous way. I said, I'm the inner healing king of the universe. Like there's not <laughs> an inner healing program that I have not done. But what I said to him was this, the beauty of doing, of going through camp, going to counseling and doing inner healing is not that you get healed. Because I don't necessarily think that the value of inner healing is, is actually is actually inner healing. Mm. We were like, I think the real value of inner healing, because a lot of people go to inner healing expecting inner healing to fix them, and then they get offended. If it doesn't. Yeah, that's not my experience. I went to inner healing not expecting inner inner healing to fix me, but what inner healing did do is it gave me language that I did not have. Yep. yep. The value of inner healing is that I actually get to, I get language that I didn't have before. Exactly. And I heart in a way that I wasn't able to communicate before. I'm able to communicate my brokenness and my needs in a way that I wasn't able to communicate before. And yeah, uh, that, you know, yeah. one thing men lack, when we'll talk about masculinity, one thing that men lack is language. Absolutely. We lack words until we don't talk. <laughs> yeah. um, and I'm that way. I talk until I get words. I don't process out loud necessarily. I process internally until I get words. And then when I get words, I'll process. And so, yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's almost like, cause so a lot of men are held within the constraints of anger, frustration, and maybe uh, sadness, right? For, um, yeah. and for me, when I learned powerful words like tenderness, um, happiness, excitement, and the full spectrum of quote, positive and negative emotions that allowed me to almost in some ways, problem solve my how I was feeling because I actually had the language for it yeah, yeah, yeah and um so also for people who are watching who aren't in Christian realms inner healing is like uh it's just Christian version of therapy essentially or uh, group therapy um so there's other forms of group therapy out there that are non-Christian that are sufficient as well um but just to give you a little more context of what he was saying but Jay do you see any questions that you'd like to pop popping up that you might want to answer here um there were a f i mean there's been several questions that i don't have answers to so uh somebody asked a few minutes ago, was masculinity at its healthiest i the, uh, it was michaela she said what does masculinity mm -hmm. look like healthiest to you specifically in your community um essential close friends and strangers uh, at its healthiest i i'm not positive uh i'm not sure that i know how to answer that um like i'm not yeah. you know i'm not the the authority on it but um 
at its healthiest, I think it's men who know who they are, who are confident, yeah. who they are unafraid uh, to be, to unexpre- unafraid to express who mm. they are. Um, yeah. That's probably a very generic answer, but that's the best I can give. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that's a that's a very intense question because the healthiest is like the most pristine. Um, yeah, that's a hard question to answer. I like it though. Thanks for asking that, Michaela. Well, Elijah asked, "What did he say?" He said, "What what are other things that are assumed of men culturally and historically that you find toxic, and how do you act in the opposite?" Um, why don't I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in on this one first, and then you can answer it, Jay. Thank you. A lot there you of- go. <laughs> Um, you know, something that I find, uh, culturally and historically kind of toxic is the machoism. Um, so I, my background is construction, right? And, um, I was an electrician and I would watch these men do things out of quote, being masculine and macho, right? But they're really just being self-destructive, right? So not wearing personal protection or, um, just, yeah, there's just so many things I would see, and they're like, oh, I'm tough, I'm a cool plumber, or badass dry, or bad uh, drywall, or what, you know, like, whatever, and I'm just like, you're just destroying your body, you're not cool, like, it's legitimately, like, is it narcissism, like, where you inflict pain on yourself, like, I literally saw that as, as men, culturally, we're expected to be tough and destroy our bodies? Like, that doesn't make sense to me at all. I will take the 10 minutes to walk to my car and get some earplugs or get some safety glasses. Like, I was very different in that respect, and it was very toxic, in my opinion, because it was legitimately, there was a direct um, negative consequence that I could see in people's lives. Um, so that's one area that I would say. But anyway, what about you, Jay? You got, you got one yet? You don't have to if you don't want to. Uh, I have, I have one that I specifically on my mind. But if I if I even go there, it's going to turn this conversation into a much longer conversation that I might <laughs> or or to go there. But um, there there are a number of them. <laughs> there are a number of of toxic uh, things related to masculinity. Um, uh, I, like one, I'll just give you. Sorry, I got caught. Oh, can you hear me? Oh, there. Yeah. Um, healthy affection is, is mm. one. Is, um, men have been taught that it's not masculine to be affectionate with other men. Like, you mm. know, besides mm-hmm. the pound and the uh, and uh, uh, you know, that whole thing. Like, um, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a stupid societal expectation, to be quite honest. Yeah. Um, you know, we're taught that um, the highest and best form of affection is, um, well, let's just put it this way. Uh, all affection has been categorized as, as being sexual. Mm-hmm. And, um, and that's just wrong. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's wrong and it's broken and it's immature. And um, the truth is men need affection as much as women. Yep. But most men are really willing to say that, ask for it, or even. Mm-hmm even need known and so uh you know uh, i don't know why it's a it, it, nobody has a problem at all with me loving on my son and holding him kissing his cheek and you know being affectionate but as soon as tim tebow kisses his son then all of the world goes nuts and starts to call it pedophilia or something crazy and i'm going yeah, yeah. try and stop me from being affectionate with my son <laughs> and see what <laughs> like like that the security yeah. uh of that is just amazing and i'm not you know obviously just talking about father's father the father son thing there are boundaries i'm not talking about not having boundaries um i'm talking about just uh the freedom to give a hug and uh mm-hmm. and not be weird <laughs> and um <laughs> and not yeah, everybody absolutely um, it's a big subject that's not popular. I'll, I'll just, yeah, I'll just throw in there at the end. I remember my brother was teaching me about the Amish because he had been interacting with them on some level. 
and the men kiss lip on lip there, like in their culture, like big old bearded dudes, like, and it's just normal to them. And I always like, I always have that in the back of my mind that culturally it just depends on how you're raised. And, like, it's just societal upbringing. Like, um, sadly, I think I'm going to bring this to a close. Uh, thank you everyone so much for watching. Um, I really appreciate it. And thank you, Jay, for being on here with me and hey, doing this doing this test run with me. Um, Great. I will be posting my website and Facebook group. If you guys want more info on topics like this, that's where it'll be. And I'll probably end up creating a Facebook group just for these videos. Um, is there anything else you want to say, Jay? I'm great, man. Thanks so much for taking the time to, to have this chat and for everybody who jumped on and asked questions. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, everyone, so much for watching and post for more videos. Peace.